Maura Gamble is a global permaculture ambassador, teacher, filmmaker, podcaster, and founder of the Permaculture Education Institute. She mentors people on six continents how to create thriving home and community gardens. And on this topic, has a popular permaculture blog and YouTube channel, Our Permaculture Life. She walks her talk, living amidst her award-winning edible garden at Crystal Waters Eco Village, where she's been for over 20 years. Morag is a co-founder of Northy Street City Farm in Brisbane, and the Australian City Farms and Community Gardens Network. And more recently, Perma Youth, a global youth in permaculture program that even reaches to a number of refugee camps. Her work as a permaculture educator has taken her to 22 countries and through the Ethos Foundation, her permaculture charity, she offers support to women and youth in the global south to access permaculture education and create home nutrition garden programs. <clears throat> in her new podcast, Sense Making in a Changing World, Morag is excited to share conversations with leading thinkers and positive change makers with a permaculture twist. Please welcome our third and final speaker, Morag Gamble. Thanks, Lauren. And thank you to both Stuart and Tim I just sat there with an enormous smile on my face, listening to the type of farming that you're doing and just feeling a hope for the future and hope for our land and our country and the way that we do food and do food business and connect with community and connect with land. I want to take us to a completely different scale, a scale right into, into the home. And uh, so I'm going to talk about permaculture, and food production from a, from, a, from a home garden perspective. So this is, this is my garden, and, and I, 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 one of the smiles that came across my face was when you talked about loving your land, and uh, it is about that. It is about that deep connection that you start to feel with a place and you start to notice. I was just sitting there the other day. This is my favourite tree underneath the... Um, one of my bouquets. I always take bouquets wherever I go of edible plants and edible flowers and bush tucker plants. So in the midst here I've got um, the, the lemon myrtle. So it's right out the front of my veranda so I can just walk out and grab some leaves. It's the last flavour that you want to put in a soup or a stir fry or into a cup of tea and it's a nice spot to sit and just grab a leaf and crush it. And I sit there and I watch what's happening. And today I was watching as this beautiful little fairy wren, you know the ones with the red backs? And I was watching from this spot here as it was darting around the garden through the kales and down underneath the lettuces and picking off little bugs. And it was just, you know, that moment of, of appreciation. And the other day there was a, a little um, a grey shrike thrush doing exactly the same thing. Oh my God, I'll put this down. Climbing climbing up the side of the kale, hanging on and just picking off little things. And, and my son, who's seven, um, it's, he's, he's called it lemon. And there's, he has a friend too, because these are birds that we'd, he'd rescued uh, from when there was the last big downpour and the, um, the, oh, the rain, uh, what do they call that, the rain butt. The, there was a nest in there and this poor little nest had babies in it and one of them had its leg stuck and was its neck was up in the water and, and my son saved it and anyway this bird stays there and the bird stays in our in our garden pecking off all these pests and so there's these all these layers of connection and and uh, relationship that are formed one of the things about where I live in Crystal Waters which is an eco village uh, there's about 250 people who live there on about 640 acres we each have about one acre that's our own but most of the land is common land. Most, like about 500 acres is common land. The top hillsides are all uh, regenerating, uh, regenerating forests to stabilize the slopes. All the gullies are all protected and turned either into dams or, or wetlands uh, as a way to sort of slow down and distribute the water. Um, the river flats is where we have shared agricultural land and right next to the river is this big buffer zone of protected uh, uh, riparian space. So we live in the very 
um, upper stretches of the Mary River, just further up from here, about an hour, surrounded by the Conondale Ranges. And, and so re when we got there 30 years ago at this eco-village, the land was absolutely degraded. There was erosion everywhere and uh, really no trees, a few trees up in the top hills. And so over 30 years, it's remarkable actually to see what change can take place actually even much sooner. But one of the things that I notice around thinking around food and thinking about the impact of our food system is that if everyone in the world lived like a typical Australian, we would need four Earths, but we only have one. And much of that footprint is food related. Uh, just recently, there was something called Earth Overshoot Day. Uh, when I was born, just off the end of this chart here, in 1969, we were living a one-planet way of life. Now we're living a uh, four-planet way of life in Australia and globally 1.6. We've had a slight drop this year. You can see there, because of COVID, it's just dropped down a little bit, but nowhere near enough. So the shift that needs to happen is really needs to be far more widespread. What this overshoot day means, uh, the, the, you can find these charts on the Global Footprint Network. So this is looking at when each of the countries has actually um, used up its annual budget of its ecological capacity. You have to scan right back to March, I think it's March 30th, March 30th for Australia. So that means everything that we've done since March is in overshoot. We used up our ecological budget to absorb our waste and meet our needs on March 30th. So everything that we're doing now and to the end of the year uh, is actually, sorry, I clicked the wrong click button, is eating into future generations, ecological systems, uh, other species capacity to, to um, thrive and flourish. And so August 22nd was actually the day when globally we had that overshoot. And so when I see figures like this, it just kind of rams it home quite significantly, the work that we yet have to do. And the work, why I focus, and I've always focused in the food system, is because that's where our impact is the largest, and that's where everyone is connected, because, you know, unless you're a breatharian, you eat. So wherever you are in the food system, you can connect. So I chose to focus from a permaculture perspective and really looking at how we can create one planet way of life. So kind of the question that I started asking was really, what is a healthy human habitat? What are the things that we need to support and nourish us, uh, all, of, all of us, in all different ways? And that's where uh, permaculture design focuses beginning in the food system, but then also looks at how you integrate your housing, your economic systems, into an ecologically balanced way. Uh, and so I, I was thinking about translating the type of principles that you're talking about uh, into my garden, and it, and it just fitted beautifully. It is about creating an abundance of plants. It's about slowing down the water. We have this kind of principle in permaculture that says, slow it, spread it, sink it, store it. You know, that's the, that's the water strategy about trying to really slow it down. I wonder if I've got a picture that can show you just an absolute density of plants. So you can see in there, there's my, my broad beans there. And so when they're finished, I'll just drop them down and then I'll plant something else in through. And actually, yeah, all like <laughs> it's mostly like that, yeah. But the thing is, it's small scale as well. You know, we're talking about my place is one acre and my main section of garden that feeds my family and I and, you know, neighbours and whoever else comes along. Uh, so uh, this, is, this has a lot of self-seeding plants, a lot of perennial plants. Um, I actually um, have not planted a pumpkin for well over a decade, but yet I get an abundance of pumpkins every year because I think about the pumpkin. Like, the per what is the purpose of a pumpkin? The purpose of a pumpkin actually is, is to nourish the seeds inside. And so I always leave a couple of pumpkins rotting in a corner where I want them to sprout off again. And all those enzymes that break down nourish the soil and create this beautiful pumpkin patch that comes along. And so uh, the other... Oh, there's a bit of a slug there. Um, the, food for lemon. <laughs> 
The other thing that I really think about too is, of, of course, it's always about the soil and the soil life and protecting the soil and, and noticing through what's happening on the plants is telling me what's going on underneath. And so um, as much perennial plants, self-seeding plants that don't need a massive amount of water or care in a way that it becomes almost like a cultivated ecological system. And I've noticed when I've gone away to do work overseas, I come back and I look in my garden, I think, what can I eat? And I go around and I notice all the things that have thrived for maybe six months without me doing absolutely anything. And they're the plants that I use as the basis of this thriving edible landscape that is my home garden. And so what is, what is good food? I mean, that's a question too, isn't it? I mean, for me, I always think about the best possible food is the food which you've harvested just as, as almost the moment before you've eaten it. The nutrient density of that is just so high. But also it's about the diversity of foods. So it's thinking about, you know, instead of just having spinach, for example, you have a leaf of this, a leaf of that, and a leaf of that. There might be 20 different leaves that you've picked for your salad or for your, your greens, and each one is, is bringing different nutrients. And uh, so, um, you know, and when you're eating the plants, you're eating all of the food, all of the plant. So, you know, little radishes, I eat all of, all of that. When I'm eating pumpkin, for example, so I grew up in a household with a dad that loves to make pumpkin soup. And uh, he would always dutifully chop off all the edges, scoop out all the seeds, made a beautiful soup. And then I was around at a friend's house. It must have been, oh gosh, maybe 10 years ago now. And there she was with a pumpkin and she had a, a machete looking type thing. And pop, 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 pop. And I just chucked in the pot. I said, what are we eating? Pumpkin soup. And I, was a little bit taken aback and then she explained to me she was saying well you know like most of the phytonutrients uh you know in the skin look at it it's beautiful and when you cook it up it's soft and it's great the seeds are full of protein so why not add those in as well and when you blend it all up as pumpkin soup who would know you know and so i've started doing that ever since now what happens when you do that you start to actually diminish the amount of food waste that you have absolutely amazing amount of food waste that we toss out thinking it's the non-edible bits. It's the leaf of the radish, it's the skin of the pumpkin, it's the, the leaf of the broccoli. You know, like if we start to think even on farm or in our gardens, which are the bits that we don't eat? We've sort of started to only focus on particular parts. We've become very fussy eaters. So I challenge people to say, I think I can help you grow 10 times as much food that you ever thought possible just by shifting the way that you perceive what's growing in your garden. And it's, it's actually quite amazing. For example, uh, this one here. You all know what this one is, I'm sure. So this is the pumpkin leaves. Does anyone ever eat their pumpkin leaves? Oh, great, there's a few nods. That's wonderful. I actually didn't realize that you could eat pumpkin leaves. I was in Korea at one point teaching there, and there was these beautiful big leaves in the middle of the table. And they'd steam them up, and then you'd, you'd put some... Uh, Put some, you put the leaf there and then you put a bit of rice and vegetables and then wrap it all up as like a nice little dolmadi type of thing, dip it in some dipping sauce. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, and then all the, the shoots, the shoots, the young leaves are edible. Obviously the flowers are edible. I mostly go for the male flowers so I don't lose my pumpkin capabilities. Or if this tendril has snuck out across a path where I don't want it, I snip it off, and if it's got a little baby pumpkin on it, I eat that. It's like a, it's like a squash or a zucchini. I mean, we eat young zucchinis, but we don't eat young pumpkins. Now, then I wonder, too, about if all of this is edible, what happens to it in the broad-scale pumpkin farming situation? That's a, we talk about how we, we waste 40% of the food that's grown in the world. But I would actually think we probably waste a whole lot more when we think of all the stuff that we don't eat. All the sweet potato leaves, all the pumpkin leaves, all the broccoli leaves, all the cauliflower leaves, all, the, you know, all, of, all of that. All of the shoots of the peas and everything. Which is why I encourage people to try and grow as much food, good food that they can, as close to home as possible. Because this stuff is just easy. This stuff is, um, you know, 
to be able to just walk straight out from your home to be able to pluck things. So this is a few years ago now, it was when I first set up some terraces to try and slow spread. I'm on a one in five slope. And so I mix all different sorts of things from, uh, you know, from the, the herbs, the flowers, the fruit trees, the natives, the ground covers, um, things like uh, this one here, this is the, the edible canna. And now this is something that I use as, you know, it might seem as one of those, it kind of relate to your weedy plants. You know, it grows like a weed, but yet there's a couple of edible varieties. I grow it because it grows up quickly. I get a huge amount of biomass. It helps to protect the soil. It provides a bit of a windbreak, a bit of a sunbreak, and then I can chop and drop regularly so that it's just going down, improving the soil. I watch as it kind of collects the moisture in the morning and sends it down into the soil, and then as there's little frogs hiding in those little spots. So it helps to immediately add um, habitat and biomass. And then these bits are edible. This is my you know, subtropical potato that's so easy to grow. Uh, so within that, there's, there's lots going on. I also think that it's really important to focus on, on seeds, particularly in our home gardens, of looking at the type of seeds that we grow that we can save from year in, year out. And the, the idea of having a, a, like a seed bank, I think, is really important. But I actually think what even more important than that is a seed exchange. Because seeds that stay in storage aren't adapting and growing and changing and evolving. You know, I think we need to keep them... Uh, what I've noticed anyway, the seeds that come into my garden and just keep growing in my garden become more suited to my soil. They become more suited to my local microclimate, more suited to all of the things of how I work with it. And, and then, you know, for example, this is my uh, mustard seed. Uh, so my, my green leafy mustard. I've got a couple of varieties that just self-seed in my garden all the time. And I actually help, they use me to help manage the land. They're just a constant source of food. If they've come up somewhere I don't want them, I just keep plucking them and eating them for salad or stir fries. I keep eating them until they become... When they start seeding, they seed really quickly, they get this sort of wobbly stem which you can harvest and that keeps them going for longer. But it's like a spicy asparagus. I eat that. Then when they start to go to, um, to flour... I was going to eat that then. I was... <laughs> we went into a nice mustardy flavour. Um, I took a bit of... <laughs> um, so when you, when you eat that, then it's this beautiful thing in a salad or a stir fry. And then they turn into, you get the seeds, the seed pods. And when the seed pods go brown and dry like this, you can um, brush them in a, either in a... I get my kids to cut, snip them all off, pop them into a, uh, an old sheet, wrap them up and do a dance on it. And we get a massive great jar of them. And then we turn that into mustard, seedy mustard and just chuck a few around and it'll come up again. And so it's this thing of thinking about not just plant and pull, plant and pull. It's about how do each of those plants in all of their space and time across their life cycle can be incorporated. And I think it's important to really recognise that, you know, we've lost so much. Some people say 75%, some people say 95%. It's somewhere in that realm of species diversity. We rely on pretty much three... Um, three plants for most of the food that we eat, and 75% of our food comes from 12 species. So it's no wonder that uh, the system is broken, our ecological system and our gut system and all, everything. So bringing back the diversity, I think, is really important. And then, as I've said before, you know, the home growing food and being able to eat it cuts waste, but it also means that you can cycle it back in as quickly as possible. So everything just goes straight back into the garden. I have a whole lot of things that I call in situ composting. So instead of actually taking my food scraps to a spot to compost them and then to put them out, I'll just kind of scatter bins in and around the garden. And so I'll, um, it'll be there. If I notice a spot that needs a bit of regeneration, that's where the compost bin goes. And when it's full, lift it off, spread it out, make a new garden, move the bin somewhere else instead of having to kind of wheelbarrow everything. Um, and then, you know, worm farms in the garden. If it's too hot, the worms go down into the soil and then they come back up and eat the stuff I've taken out. And I just keep moving these things around and regenerating bits of soil that need it and doing the chop and drop and the, all those sorts of things. And always a diversity. If there's a gap, I plug it. But mostly nature plugs it anyway. I don't tend to 
you know, it's kind of crazy. People say, you must spend a lot of time gardening. I embarrassingly say I don't spend much time working in the garden. I spend a lot of time going around munching flowers and <laughs> harvesting lunch and watching what's going on. So, you know, part of this is also about rewilding. So there's watching all the different species that come in, seeing, how, seeing which are the plants which attract the wildlife, seeing the ones which are attracting the pollinators, seeing what it is that the kangaroos eat and the wallabies eat. And I've had built up this beautiful relationship now that the kangaroos kind of maintain the grassy paths and the wallabies trim off the edges of the sweet potatoes along the terraces. And we have a really good arrangement. Um, so, and, you know, and it works. And I always make sure that I've scattered through enough plants that are there for the bees and always leaving things flowering, always leaving things flowering. And it's a constant buzz. I mean, at the moment, it's absolutely um, just alive with, with the sound of the bees in the garden. And, you know, it's in my lifetime, again, we've lost two thirds of the species. It, it's just, it's, it saddens me so much that we've got to this point, but yet we continue on whereas we can turn things around quite significantly in our homes. And then, you know, what we don't grow ourselves, we then support local farms, local farm stores, local restaurants, local cafes, and it's all part of this whole system. And one of the things I, th I really love about encouraging people to, to grow is that it means they start to understand what it takes to grow food and actually how hard it is and be willing to pay more or to seek out local farmers and to understand the system and the seasons and the cycles of nature and, and the real value of food and the real taste of food. So I spend a lot of time also working, doing community gardening programs and um, workshops, less at the moment because of COVID, but as much as I can, really helping to bring gardening to the commons. Um, you know, it's interesting to think when you go into urban areas, um, there's a figure of Los Angeles that says 50% of the common land is road. We f kind of forget that, that all of that space is also our commons. It's like thinking about what are all the spaces in between? Where can we grow food? How can we shift and change things? This is Northeast Street City Farm in Brisbane, a project I was involved in starting up, um, gosh, 25 years ago. It, it's a, um, it was just degraded urban farmland, so there's four hectares of land that's now a food forest there. And really focusing on trying to pass it on, passing the joy of, of the gardening on for my kids, but also any other kids, and opening up farms and gardens and community gardens to opportunities for them. And, we've, and I encourage, in order to do this, is to... This sounds really silly and naive, but eat from your garden every day. It takes you out into your garden. You see what's seasonal, you see what's happening, you see what's working, what's not working. Uh, what's going on with the chickens or what's, you know, often I've seen, and I say this and it's probably not so much relevant to you, but I've seen it in, particularly in the cities, in, you know, around Brisbane, people start up a garden but then not eat from it. We've started up so many community gardens and we can't give away the food. It's more the community that people are liking to build or just the relax, the mental health side of it, the relaxation. Uh, but anyway, eating your food and, you know, holes cook well too. You know, this is uh, one of the things I try and get. You know, the thing about perfect food, it doesn't have to be the most beautiful looking thing. I, I tried to actually find a holy kale today to bring to say that holes cook well, but I couldn't find a holy Oh no, there is a hole in it. The birds have done a beautiful job of pecking off all the, all the things. Well, I've just ripped it. Never mind. But anyway, so, you know, that idea that we can get past, you know, get past the perfection thing. And part of the passing on, I wanted to let you know, if you do have any young people that you are connected with, somewhere between 11 to 18, we now have this program called Perma Youth. And every week, young permaculture interested kids get together and talk about permaculture. They also um, have permaculture camps. And um, we've just started this thing called the Global Perma Youth Festival. And we have kids from around the world joining in. And so uh, next Saturday, we've got David Holmgren, who's the founder of, uh, co-founder of Permaculture, the, uh, a permaculture illustrator, Brenna Quinlan, and Charlie McGee, who's a, a permaculture musician, joined by groups all around the world. So we host um, perma youth groups uh, in various parts, even in refugee camps in Kenya and Uganda, and they join in and they've been making music and films and um, all sorts of things. And it's this cross-cultural uh, expression of what it is that the future holds for young people. And I think 
this kind of started after all the campaigns and the kids on the streets and all that and yelling for change, doing that and then going home, but okay, well, what now? You know, I campaigned on the streets, but I come home and the school's the same and things are the same at home. What do we do next? What is the life that we want to create? What is a healthy human habitat? What, you know, what can we do and how can we still be heard? So that's what this is all about. And I, please share that with your friends and anyone you know who's in that kind of 11 to 18 year old group. Um, also wanted to let you know too that I have about 400 different articles and films on our permaculture life. So that's a resource that's there about all practical things to do with permaculture and also a YouTube channel with 200 different films of how-tos and things. And, and you know, the most amazing thing about this is this, this particular film, the How to Make a No-Dig Garden, is, has been watched over a million times. People want to know how to, how to grow food. And, you know, we know too with the, uh, you know, with COVID, um, there was the toilet paper run, then there was a big seed run. And, uh, I, people have been coming out of the woodwork trying to find out just basic information. So if you know how to do it, share it. Start up a community garden, share up a verge garden, open your garden, share some seeds. I've heard about people starting up little uh, street front uh, sharing uh, places for all different sorts of things. So there's that. There's the podcast as well, uh, interviews with David Holmgren and a lot of uh, really interesting permaculture people and related. Um, and there's also the Ethos Foundation, which is something uh, that you mentioned early on, which is about supporting people in other parts of the world. Because part of what permaculture is about is earth care, people care, and fair share. And it's really thinking about what is enough and what is the impact of our way of life on other places, other cultures, other peoples. And it's something that I heard earlier this year that really has stuck with me, that the World Food Program said that 265 million people will be pushed to the brink of starvation by the end of this year. And that's going to be mostly the people in refugee camps and in places that already are really hard pushed. What is it that things like permaculture and stuff that I do, how can that help? And so that's where we're working with the Ethos Foundation to um, help to create uh, kitchen garden programs and uh, send resources for that. And so this is Sakina here. I met her in Uganda last year, and uh, she runs Perma Kids program, Perma Youth program. She's teaching teachers who will teach more kids. She's running programs to get farms throughout the place. And I was talking about, oh, wouldn't it be great if you had artists to help draw this all up in your local language? She said, yeah, I have artists. And I got really excited, and she said, but they're, they don't draw. And I said, well, what do they do? And she said, oh, well, they sing and they, they, they're comedians and they're actors. And I thought, that's even better. So they've started making these films because I think as a way to spread this out, often I find like I'm really quite too earnest about what I talk about. Whereas there, they're singing it and dancing it and sharing in a way that I think will ripple further and faster. And uh, some of the songs I've had translated and they're saying, this way of growing food, not the chemical way that we're told, not the GMO seeds that we're told, but this way of growing food is what is going to save us and help me feed my kids. And thank you. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Morag. <laughs>